Are you a father who's been denied access to your children after a very bitter divorce? Then you're not on your own. Obviously, there's many fathers. And today, to discuss that, we have Ahmed Ridan in the studio to talk about their organization, Muslim Fathers Support Group, which helps unite fathers with their children after an acrimonious divorce. But here today, we're going to discuss who is normally to blame in these situations. Is it the father? Is it the mother? Or both? We welcome our guest, Ahmed Ridan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm good, brother. Zakallah for letting me onto your platform to discuss this co- this topic. Inshallah, it'll be a benefit to the community. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Uh, it's a very uh, topical, very controversial, very relevant subject this day and age because, as you know, divorce has gone through the roof. Mm-hmm. And uh, normally, in a divorce situation, well, children become the casualties mm-hmm. in and sometimes the collateral, the leverage, Mm -hmm. maybe one parent is using to get back at the other. Absolutely. And this is what you're going to discuss because you also have a personal story. So what is the Muslim support uh, group for fathers? So the Muslim Fathers Support Forum group, um, we're basically a peer support group. We're from the grassroots. We're all brothers that have been through the system to fight for our children that have been denied access. Um, and it started just pre-pandemic, just the first lockdown. So it kind of started, well, it really started from my journey, in all honesty. So in 2010... So you're one of the founding members of this organization? I'm the actual founder of it. Um, so in 2010, um, I split from my then wife, from the, from that marriage. I have two children, a boy and a girl. Um, and... For for the from from 2010 to 2015, alhamdulillah, everything was good. Um, I saw my kids regularly on the weekend, um, and we we were all good. How old were the kids then? So the kids would have been around uh, eight, <coughs> eight and four. Well, actually, at the break time would have been about four, four and eight okay. ish in that kind of zone. Um, so for five years, I had access weekly, and alhamdulillah, everything was going good. Uh, under Sharia, the house is mine because it was in, under my name. I paid for everything. Uh, and I was told, as a man, it's your duty to provide. So Islamic jurisprudence was put forward. The, the Sharia was put forward in our marriage that you have to be the provider. Okay. So I paid gas, electric, the whole lot. You know. So, so just to clarify, when you divorced, so did your wife and children stay in the matrimonial home or did they leave the matrimonial no, home? No. So I said to him, look, uh, I said, I want the best for the kids. Mm-hmm. So, you know, stay here with the kids, look after them, don't pay rent, don't pay me anything. I will pay the mortgage off, and inshallah, when I've paid the mortgage off, I will then sign it over to the kids so that they have uh, a level up because obviously we all come from poverty. You know, I, we came here in the 70s and what have you. So I didn't want that, I didn't want my children to have that struggle. I wanted them to have something already to come some generational wealth. So that was the agreement we had. So your wife was happy with that. She was happy with that. You know, she was there. I said, just all you do is look look after the house, keep it maintained. Um, you know, you're not paying uh, rent or anything. Just keep it, and then this this looking after the investment for our children, mm-hmm. and that's that. Um, and so, in actual at the time, I should have been paying about four hundred pounds in um, in maintenance if you went down that route. But I was actually paying eight hundred pounds to. Keep the house. mortgage as well. Yeah, that's right. So the, 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 uh, we bundled together. I said, look, I'll, I'll pay double that, but, but you know, the house so that the house comes over to the kids. Great. We had that agreement. So that went on for five years. Then in 2015, I got married. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when the big fun and games began. So just before I was due to get married, uh, I received a, a sister's letter saying, first, it actually started off with very weird that, oh, she wants to move to Dubai. She's got a job there or something. Then it said, no, she's not moving now. She wants the house. And I said, no, that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, how did you feel about your children moving to Dubai? Obviously, well, that would have created well, access issues for you. Well, first, I was, I was a bit confused that all of a sudden, this has come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, to, to get to move to somewhere like Dubai, it takes a bit of time. You're six, eight months, nine months. You know, you go find a job, this, that, the other. Or you even have that discussion. Mm-hmm. But it's all about, uh, really, suddenly, this is turning up. I was like, no. Then, but sure enough, you know, I did a bit of somewhere. Like, let's see what's going on here. And then the next letter that came along 
oh, she's not moving to Dubai. Now we're going to, we, she wants the house. And I said, no, um, that's not how it works. We had an agreement. I stuck by my agreement. That's not the case. So next thing I know, if the kids stopped coming to me in September 23rd, uh, 2015 was the last time I saw my kids. I had them with me. After that, contact was stopped. And then about a month or two later, I had the police come banging on my door one morning. Um, and they caught me off to the police station and said, right, you've been accused of uh, rape and child molesting. Really? And, and the rape allegations were from 2010, <coughs> allegedly. After the divorce? Uh, no, just prior to the divorce or something, okay. around in that timeline. I, the timeline don't even make sense to me. So I've raped you. You know, in that time, we've had a five years of like back and forth, me picking the kids up from the house, this, that, the other. How was your relationship like uh, after the divorce when you used to go and pick the kids up? It was fine. Up? It was, it was no, no issues. Yeah. You, you know, we used to kind of, I said, she used to run a, a, a little business, uh, sending, getting stuff from Pakistan, um, some outfits. So I used to go drop it to the post office for her on, on occasion. And if she needed like me to wash the kids. You know, I used to drop my daughter off in the morning to school. I used to go pick my son up from the dresser. For the five years, that's what I was doing. That was that was the level. I had everyday contact with the kids. If you don't mind me asking, what was the actual reasons for the divorce, or do you not want to go into that? In all honesty, we were never the right fit. Um, okay. You know, looking back at it, um, the type of person she is and the type of person I'm, we we just weren't right. It was a, a kind of a family dishta, but in all honesty, she felt that she wore the trousers, um, that she could dictate, and I was submissive. In all honesty, um, you know, I didn't have, I was 23 at the time, 23, 24 when I got married. I didn't have the skill set. I didn't have the, the leadership about me. I didn't have, I didn't even know myself. Like, what am I really into? What am I about? What my philosophy, you know, what my outlook on life is. Mm-hmm. Everything I had at that point was other people's ideas, not my own. And then they had this person berating me, telling me I'm not Islamically good enough. I don't pray enough. Uh, my family are Jahil. My mother's like this. You know, uh, and what then does Jahil mean J- Jahil, Jahil for the viewers. Who... So, so Jahil is like what, what we'd call a backward, okay. uh, an educated, uh, educated literate, literate in, in the aspect of uh, Islam and stuff like that. You know, uh, and I'm just like, no, you know, it don't work like that. My family have love. Mm-hmm. You know, um, they're, they're they're kind, decent people, mm-hmm. and that's what you should be focusing on. They're, every time you turn up, they give you salam, they treat you well. They go out their way for you, but you can't see that. But yeah, all this. But basically, all of that was just a sidestep. But I mean, I mean, I've heard that a little bit from yourself. Unfortunately, we don't want to go into too much detail because the sister uh, is not there to defend herself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. obviously, there's always three sides to a story: your side, her side, uh, and the, the independent, the truth. Yeah. yeah. So this is something that we have to take on board as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. But for, from my perspective, yeah. we'll, you know, we'll give it that. But it just came down to. You know, she started. She started it off by throwing me out the house first. Um, you know, uh, and then I came out of it, and I was like, actually, no, this is better. You felt <laughs> liberated. I felt liberated. I'll be honest with you, because a lot of men don't leave. You know, statistics even recently show that women leave marriages more than men. Yeah. Um, and the only reason I was there was because my family wouldn't allow it. Mm-hmm. I had children. I didn't want to be away from them, and I knew that you know. That if if I come out of this, I'm not going to see my kids. But I'm not, that wasn't the case for the first five years. So we were just different. Well, you people. said there's a lot of men in that situation where they're stuck in. We hear often about women, but there's men stuck in relationships which they want out, but they're unable absolutely to get out. Because, and I think this is what leads to toxic, unhealthy relationships. And I think that was it because I was not happy in the relationship, and you know I put my hands up. You know I was not the best person. You know, I was going through a lot. You know, I was trying to find my way. And I felt like I was just being treated like a meal ticket. You know, that my function, you know, I kept kept being shoved in my face, the the, the Shelly, Shelly says, you've got to provide. You know, you've got to pay for everything. You've got to pay for everything. At the time, I used to earn about £2,000 a month. Mm -hmm. (laughs) At the end of the month, I'd I'd be lucky to have £30, £40 in my account because that's what she was spending. She had my car and she had a blitz, everything. Spending on what? I don't know. I, you know, even now to this day, I'm still like, I don't know what my money was ever being evaporated on. But why, uh, as a ma- husband, as a man, did you not 
stop to ask and uh, you know uh, and this is it you know what because every time we kind of approach a subject oh you don't want to pay for your family oh you're cheap or oh, you're this or oh, you're that when you're the one that's paying and you're going to and then you know you kind of get this and then you feel like you're not doing right by your family that you know you having to want a bit of money for yourself to for whatever it is for your clothes for your outings for you to go out with your friends and all that all of a sudden it was out yeah, I'd wait I used to just go play football once a week with my cousins just to keep that so you're going out much with your friends for no, a year all that kind of stopped you know um, I was just very much homely I got accused of having multiple affairs I mean at the time I was 16, 17 stone my beard was like that my hair was like that I was very unkept you know because I was being drained um, uh, and I, I was really lost and in that state I was getting attacked and I used to retaliate um, so what was the basis of his allegations of affairs? I mean, what you must have given some suspicion to her to uh, suspect that you're probably having an affair. I really? don't know. Well, I got accused of like six six affairs. Okay, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I don't I don't know what's going on. You know, um, I, I don't know. I, I whatever motivated her because, in all honesty, it, it kind of really put me back in in a shell. I was really scared to like interact with people and. All these sorts of things. Because you felt you were being under, put on the spotlight and scrutinised in all your interactions. Yeah, I just, I just, but to be honest, it's. I think what it came down to was this: I was just unhappy. I was unhappy after the year two, in all honesty, and it should have ended there. But family pressures, this, that, the other, and not not having the strength within myself to say no, let's end it here before it gets a lot worse. And that's what it was. From that moment onwards, it was just getting worse and worse and worse. And it carried on for 12 years. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and especially when, the, the moment I held the kids and she saw me hold the kids in my hand, she knew I've got this guy. She knew I've got the leverage now. Because the look on my face was like I was besotted. You know, and I was trying to be a dad. But I, like even for me, it was difficult because I knew I grew up without a father. It was just me and my mom. My father passed away when I was six months old. We came to the UK from Malawi. Um, so I'm trying to be this person, but I've had, I've got no idea. Then I'm being told to be, I have to be this other thing, which I'm not. So there's a lot of things going on. And all that was leading to an unhealthy relationship. And Alhamdulillah, she did the right thing and told me to get out. Okay. And, and I'm really thankful for that. So that was your green card to get out, basically. Yeah. <laughs> when so, she is the one who kicked you out. Yeah, so she kicked me out saying, yeah. you know, thinking, oh, this will motivate him to become better, to do what I want, and this, that, the other. But actually, it motivated me to say, actually, you know what, this situation is wrong. I'm not the best here for my children um, in this situation. Um, and then she sort of wants to reconcile. I said, no. Um, I think so we're just this was a description ways. of this marriage then. So my analysis of what you're telling me, this was very much a sort of, you're telling me that your wife was in a way a bully and you were the submissive type of person that I wasn't was submissive um, I would retaliate but the way I'd retaliate was wrong because look as Muslim men we don't generally date or if we do date the ones that do date do it undercover and yeah, stuff like that obviously. but we never live with the we never live with a woman until we're married yeah so we don't have that skill set like our uh, the, the, the non-Muslim counterparts yeah they they do all of that stuff and then they slowly build up they must be they even have kids then about five, six years later, yeah, they're that, married. That, that's not a standard for a Muslim man no. to aspire to. That, no, no. Uh, neither, uh, you know, for centuries, it's been like that, yeah. where your marriage has been arranged, you meet the person, and in many cases, you don't ever get to see them properly and even have a full interaction until after you've been married. Mm. So, But the dynamics have changed as well. So, so that formula... Way back when, yeah. even, even though even uh, the non-Muslim people had that formula in, in some ways, yes. if you look at the royal family, yes. that's what they had. Yeah. You know, Charles and Diana. They you know, even, even uh, traditional in, indigenous societies here. Yeah, they had very much arranged marriages. Or as soon as they met somebody, there was no none of this long courting yeah. and you know living like boyfriend and girlfriend. Marriage was at the forefront of their mind. Exactly. So this this is, this new thing has been developed in the, in the past thirty years. We'll call yeah. it. Right, maybe a bit longer, maybe a bit shorter, but essentially that that way. But for, but the Muslim experience has still standard, stayed the same, and that is you don't move in with a girl with a woman until you are married. Yeah, that's it. And you know everybody he did the, we do the ceremonies and everything, and that's it. So we don't have the the skill, the knowledge of 
to deal with the new modern woman that's yeah. that's been developed. My, my then wife was educated. She had aspirations of her own. She felt that she could lead. Um, and she used to push me about and dictate to me, like, no, we've got to get this house. I've got to get that house and this thing and that thing. You know, and I, I didn't have the, the, the strength within me to say no. But then when it kind of built up, I think a lot of men are quite placid yeah, like that. And then we're like volcanoes. We're just there, we're just there, we're just there, we're just dead. And I get the woodpecker thing. They'd love that. And then we erupt. And that's that eruption. That's that's that leads us to mistakes. So, so Ahmed, give me give me your definition of what is a modern woman, especially modern Muslim woman, from your experience or knowledge. So from what I can see is the modern Muslim woman wants a lot of it is for show. And even back when I look back on my then relationship, a lot of it was for show, to show that, oh, we're living well. We've got a big house. We've got a decent car. We're going on holiday to Tunisia or to Egypt. So to, you were able to pull to Dubai. Those demands. Yeah. I'm like, you know, uh, in life, I've been relatively quite well off in, in the sense of like my jobs allowed me to, my, my day jobs allowed me to fund my family, especially back then, because house prices were way different back then and all mm-hmm. this. So the modern women, they, they want they want to have it all. They want to have a handsome six foot four, uh, six foot tall husband, six packs, and all this sorts of stuff. Then they want to go to like that that that, that salt bay kind of guy, eat at, eat at that restaurant, and you know get him to come break, break the salt over here, you know, and all that. Um, so they all want to take the Instagram yeah. stuff, you, you know, that, that eating out and living their best lives and all this sorts of stuff that the kids are wearing. Gucci. So living their life on social media. Yeah. yeah but the, the thing is, it's not even that. It's like to show other people. And what? that's why people post on social media. Yeah. So others can see that they are living a good, shall I say, uh, Instagrammable yeah. life. So obviously, the time when I was first married, Instagram wasn't, uh, you know, mobile phones and all that. Yeah. We're, we're, just, we're just on the beginning. We're just yeah. on the start of things. Um, but this was like, a lot of it was to show her family that oh look we're doing well we've got a big house we had a, I'm like, we had a decent house and we were on the you know uh, on the road to get rid of that. but no we have to get something bigger better bigger better constantly you know like the, the woodpecker effect um, and a lot of it was that and it was just we, we, you could never just be happy but look a lot's given us this let's just be cool with it but no you know bigger better because because so and so down the road has got. They've got a house down in in a, in a plush part of Leicester. Uh, so-and-so's got a bigger house in London, and so-and-so's got a bigger house in, in Blackman or, or wherever, or, or across the country. There, there's kind of some kind of unspoken woman's competition thing. Men just look at each other, yeah, good for you, bro. Yeah, but that's not to say that men are not competitive. It's, it's getting there, it's coming, but yeah. if we don't have that same kind of... But, you know, it's quite interesting. Did you ever watch stuff like, like the Housewives of... Atlanta, the, the housewives of this, that, the other. There's the, the whole series of these things called housewives. Yeah. So, you know, on, on occasion, with, uh, channel hopping, you kind of come across this rubbish. And you see the women, and the women want to fight each other, and the women are, are competing against each other. There's this other thing called that Dubai bling thing, and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Same rubbish, you know, re- rubbish reality TV. But you always see it's the women that are driving the flashness and stuff. You see the men, the men are in the background. You know, the, the, the men don't get in for the fights and all this sorts of stuff. It's the women. Um, and I think this is something that's developing. And I'm not blaming sisters. They're not all sisters are like this. Let me put this out there. There's, there's, but the, the sisters, the influence that's out there, these are the kind of influences that sisters... You know, back the, back in the day, the sisters were influenced by Vogue magazine and all this sorts of stuff. Yeah. And they all wanted to be thin like sticks and, mm-hmm. you know, and all this sorts of stuff. But now the modern day stuff is this influencer sort of stuff. You know, and I feel sorry for women. You just know See, I, 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 I'm on obviously connected to a lot of more brothers and sisters, mm. and a lot of the brothers doing exactly the same, posting on their social media, showing the bling bling, the mm. nice cars. They're on holiday in Dubai. They're on holiday in uh, some other fancy location. Mm-hmm. So I say this disease is rampant across the board. Yeah, but th- think about it though. Now, wh- where is that coming from? Because to th- to be what women want. You you have to be this so-called high-value male from from the world of Tate. Okay. Yeah. Now Tate talks about this about being a high-value male, and if you're, we're we're all in competition to be what women desire. End of the day, that's our primal instinct. 
So we're getting told to be that high value male, you've got to have a, a top end job. You got, you know, you got to be earning six figures. You got to be having got a Tiffany Cartier rubbish on your wrists and all that sort of stuff, and you know, dolled out in Gucci and Versace and all that sorts of stuff. You're going to be driving a Bugatti, which is a, a Tate favorite. But that's not what a high value male is. Yeah, but who is there to say that Andrew Tate is the perfect role model that we should be following? Oh, he's not. So why are they following Andrew Tate? We should be following the best of creation that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has already told us who our role model is. Is there our beloved messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Absolutely. The thing is, we're, we're getting disconnected. We're under pressure. Look, if Muslim women want all these things, then you know Muslim men are going to look around to be those things. They want to be it's, aspired to be the man that they think that they wouldn't want them to be. You know, you know, women say you you want a man that prays five times a day and has neen, but neen leads you away from materialism. Yeah, neen sends you takes you to a path of simplicity, but the women don't want that. They they want neen for the status of neen. They want maps a man who's ritualistically praying and uh, he's uh, outwardly looks like he's practicing, but deep down. Is still connected to the world and its material possessions. Well, the thing is, it's about balance, right? Islam tells us, stay on the straight path. Not too far to the left, not too far to the right. Yeah. If you're earning high money, money is not is hard work, right, to achieve. Everybody knows, right? To get money, to spend it is easy. To yeah. get it is hard. Yeah. To get it, you've got to sacrifice your time and your effort. So if you're putting your time and effort all into that to get in the millions and all that sorts of stuff, mm-hmm. there's something on the other side going to give isn't it mm-hmm. then if you're doing something too far t- to the right then th- the stuff on the left but what women want is they want it all high dean high this that the other and uh, six figures bugatti big mansion dubai something's got to give you can't have it all and for for brothers you know what is a high value male you know i know tate and there's other brothers uh, they've they got their, their versions of high value male. my personally is knowing yourself. Knowing, everybody's different. I'm not saying that the one formula is right for all. But a Bugatti don't make you a better man. Uh, Christian Dior. Yeah, I, that I know of. that. You know that. But there's an awful lot of young men. For him, for them, these material possessions are the barometer of success. And maybe likewise for the women as well, our Muslim sisters. For them, this is the barometer of success. So what's the ultimate success? Okay. For me, yeah. Uh, for me, it's being connected to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, knowing your real identity of who we are, why we have been sent on this earth, mm-hmm. and uh, how do you know, what is our purpose, and how do we fulfill that purpose? And that will also give you uh, the uh, full understanding of the reality of the dunya and its temporary nature. Absolutely. And then, obviously, for us, the ultimate success is in the hereafter. Yes. Right. That's it. As Muslims, we have that already. We've we've given the blueprint of what what that, what, what good people look like, what what success looks like, but we're not we're not looking at that anymore. Our eyes are averted to to different things. Um, you know, our sisters they wanna they wanna hire a high value man, and then they wanna have jobs and be the, the ultimate mothers and everything. It's impossible. Everything is give and take. Find that middle road that suits you, and then be reasonable. You know, and that also includes the the brothers. You've got to be reasonable within yourself. If you're imagine if you're working in a call center, getting paid ten, fifteen pounds an hour. Or I don't know what these things are, and then suddenly you know you want to f- live the Bugatti lifestyle. It's impossible. impossible. It's impossible, right? You know, I can't have that. I've got a reasonably decent job. You know, I get paid reasonably okay. I can't afford those things. You see, the dynamics of society have operated in such a way for a long time that if you are that call center worker who's earning, let's say, £20,000 a year, Mm -hmm. £25,000 a year, you will attract somebody on the same frequency as yourself who will be more tuned to you in terms of your level of social status. Whereas the Bugatti man, the one if he is earning that level, he will attract the high value high net worth woman or somebody who aspires to be with somebody like that. Whereas if there is a woman who aspires to have a man like that, she's not going to be attracted to the 
guy who's earning twenty thousand pounds a year. See now, that's a very good point you put there, brother. But you you will often find that men will marry down. Yeah. But women hardly ever marry down. Yes. Hardly ever. That's exactly the point I just right. made. So now what you've got in yeah. there is now think about the high value male. Yeah. That's the one percent. Yes. Right. So everybody, all the females, yeah. want that one percent. Yeah. So he's got choice. He's got choice. Yeah. That, that's it. There you are. Now, if this is what you're after, then you you know what? What what are you bringing to the table? And a lot of these women, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, and I don't mean to disrespect you, don't bring enough to the table. You know, um, and that's something there. If a man ain't bringing enough to your table, then you know, you're trying to get that one percent, and you're not in that one percent yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. What are you bringing? You know. Go back to your own situation then. I just want to try and go back to how this support group was formed. So you said you had the knock on the door from the police. So we drifted away from yeah. that uh, story. So let's... so so the police came. They, I got accused of rape and child molesting. Oh dear. Um, so then I went through that. It's the usual process. So then from there, she went to women's aid. Um, and the women's aid wrote all the stuff out, you know. And, and strangely, this was the f- really funniest part that really, really shocked me. Um, so there was a story in there of me throwing her down the stairs. Yeah. Um, and she got busted up and all this sorts of stuff. But never, not once whilst we were married, were the police called on an ambulance called to my house. The only time we went to A&E was she broke her hand on a glass that my uncle got her from Disney World or something. And it, as she was washing it, it broke and it cut her. That's the only time we went for A&E. Um, then I'm reading this story that she's written about being thrown down the stairs and all this sort of stuff. Then it occurred to me that I've read this sort of stuff before. Actually, I know this. I've heard this before. It actually transpired that it was her father then this to her mother. So she took that story and applied it to, 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 to our situation and stuff. And I was just like, oh, you know. And basically, all that was to, was to stop me from... Well, well, to discredit me, but more just to, well, the, the bigger picture was she was after the house. What that did there was allowed her to get a non-molestation order against me and an occupation order against me in my own house. That house is under my name. I've been paying for it. It's mine. And the Sharia. What do you mean by occupation order? So an occupation order is a legal document uh, the court sign off. Mm -hmm. And that means that that person can stay in that property and nobody can take them out of that property. Even though it belongs to you, but they can stay in it. Okay. So they get occupancy of that property. Okay. So that, how, how did they deal with the child molestation uh, allegations? So they tried to do some uh, some sort of investigation. Now, at the time, I received some really poor information uh, uh, guidance from, uh, from from my uh, solicitor at the time. Uh, she she said to me, "Oh, you know, if you if you pursue this a bit and stuff like that, then if you go to family court and stuff and they raise it, then you, your daughter might be subject to uh, a physical examination." And this threw me it really threw me uh, back and forth like yes no yes no yes no i thought you know what leave it i went you know what just make dua have supper inshallah it'll work out so i had to just basically leave it then and then at that point i just had to cut call it draw a line at that point i, I lost my half my house she, she she stole i'm gonna say it straight up she stole half my property from me um, look just, just on that point we both been married similar times from what you told me earlier. So if my wife, who has lived in that house for 20 odd years, she's helped, I may have bought it because I'm the one working, she's been a homemaker, but I, it would have been difficult for me to go to work and build my businesses and my career if my wife hadn't been the sort of the bedrock of support in the house and build that home, look after the mm-hmm. children. So wouldn't you say that She's probably entitled to half the house. So when whilst we were married, I paid for everything. So she worked as a teaching assistant and stuff, um, and she had multiple other little side gigs. Um, she, she, the money she made, she kept in her own bank account. She spent how she wanted. Mm-hmm. She, even when she was making money, she never contributed to the household. Mm-hmm. So more importantly, as well, what does Sharia say? What does Islam say about this? Mm-hmm. Islam says that Islam is a system. Yeah. We're going to digress a little bit here. but So, like with me, I've got a mum and I've got a sister. Now, realistically, my mum is a widow and she, she has nobody. I should be looking after my mum. Mm-hmm. So her kidnap and everything should be on me. Equally, if my sister were to get divorced, that should be on, on me as well. Yeah. That's, the, that's there. Now, for her, her family are there for her. That's the, that's 
That's how the Sharia works. That's the system in place. Now, I've not developed this. Allah has developed this. Allah has sent this to us. As believing Muslims, as just a matter of faith, you say we believe in the Sharia. That's why we don't eat pork. That's why we don't drink alcohol. You know, and all these things. And all these things, fitness that are coming at us, we don't participate in because we believe in Islam. Mm. This is another part of it. And this is no different. Yeah, people can put that argument forward. You know? That's fine. There, there is wisdom in the Sharia. I know that. Yeah. yeah, There's no disputing that. But just on an individual basis, you have discretion to deal with your own affairs the way you want them to. Mm -hmm. So you're saying you resisted the fact that she takes half the house even though your children were growing up and they will ultimately get the house. That was your intention. Yeah, and my, but I stuck by my intention. You know, yeah. from there... For me, in all honesty, I never even wanted that house. You know, she she wanted it. I got it because of that. But I just wanted something for my children that I knew that was in their name. Um, and in between all of this, this was quite telling. My uncle, I sent my uncle to try and mediate. Okay. That look, he went there, um, and he spoke. To, so I think her mum, her, her her mother, her father were there, and her brother-in-law some half Chinese guy or whatever he is. Um, so he was there with a the laptop looking everything up. Um, then he, my uncle said, look, you know, you want the house. The house essentially is yours because you, you're going to be looking after the kids. The, let's put the property, if, you, if you're worried about that Ahmed's going to take it or whatever, let's put it into a trust. Mm -hmm. Ahmed will pay the house off. Once the house is paid off, you, the, the kids get it. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, you, the kids are with you, and they, they look after you, because obviously the Sharia kicks in, and uh, everything else like that. She was like, no, because my son will throw her out the house. She just wanted the house because it was hers. You know, so she wanted it. She just, she, it was for herself. It was never about the children. Yeah. And and I was sold a lie, essentially, five years ago, yeah. you know, prior to that moment, that, you know, that this is for the children. You know, and there's a level of dishonesty here. Anything that's halal, that's meant for you, when, if Allah sends something, it comes to you, you never have to do haram to get it. Yeah. You never have to rob a bank, you never have to, have to stiff somebody, you never have to tell lies, or anything of the sort. Here, to get this house that you've got now, you've had to call, you have had to f make a false allegation of rape, child molesting, go through a man-made court, because let's remember, to go to man-made courts is also haram in Islam, it's in the Quran. So you've had to do haram, haram, haram to get this, you know, and that's where I leave it at that, that, you know, that I think that speaks for itself. When couples part Islamically, you take what's yours. If, if the woman has put in 50%, she takes 50%. If she hasn't, then there, because the responsibility of brothers never dies. The responsibility on you never stops. If you've got sisters, I don't know. If they were, were to be in a situation, that responsibility is on you. If your father were to pass away, I don't, I don't know, right? That The responsibility of your mother falls upon you. The only reason I'm staying in Leicester, I could, I could move anywhere in the country. There's nicer spots in Leicester. I stay there because my mom's there. Mm. That if my mom needs me, you know, and I'm like, my mom's strong and independent, but if that were to there, that she'll come stay with me. You know, because that responsibility is on me. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, the sisters need to re recognize there's a system there. Understand the system. You know, and listen, in, in, for your relationship, build a team and participate. If you can help the men financially, ease the burden. That can only benefit the relationship. So do so. So how did you do away with the uh, allegations in the case against you? Um, so I just uh, basically went in, gave my police interview, and I said to him, look, these allegations are from ten year, uh, five years ago. It, you know, in that time, I've been seeing my children for, five, for the past five years. I've been going back and forth in the house and in, in and out and picking up the kids and all this sorts of stuff. Never have those allegations ever come before. And I had text exchanges. I, you know, I put everything forward. Keep all your evidences. <laughs> you know what? Never get rid of your texts. You know, alhamdulillah, because in there, there was so much evidence that showed the contrary. those allegations. Absolutely, right? So now, from that, you know, then the police basically just... NFA'd me, which stands for no further action me, and that was it. And then I was just left with this dilemma that do I, if I go see my, if I try to get my children, then, you know, my daughter could be potentially subjected to a, a physical examination, which is the wrong thing, you know. Um, and then I, I came to a point where I just had to get on with my life. So I drew a line underneath it. The little money I had, I had to start my life again. 
Um, and then also that the relationship that I had at the time uh, that started off in 2015 because of all the trouble and stuff that dissolved. Mm-hmm. Because I just couldn't commit to that properly because my mind was on this thing. So I just somebody you're looking to marry at the time. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, I got married. You had yeah, yeah. That, so I got married then, um, and then that that, that died down. Oh, you actually yeah. did get married. Yeah, I did get married um, to a girl from Zambia. Yeah, um, and that got destroyed because of this. Um, and then, you know, because I couldn't give my full attention. This, that, the other, everything was going on. There's no way that relationship could have been salvaged. No, no. Um, you, you know, I just again, even even then, because you know, when you get into these situations, you start a tunnel. When you get into this situation, and a lot of brothers will tell you that get into this, you get you have to become tunnel vision into like just fighting for your kids. It's it's very hard. It's all just everything's around you. The coppers are leading. You know, the, 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 about eight months you're left on this thing. That are you? Am I going to be taken to court or not? And this that the other. Then you, you're trying to get piece together, trying to reach out to your kids, and you know, trying to get access, trying to do this that the other. It, you know, and my attention was not given to that woman, mm-hmm. and she was like, "No, oh, I'm in this. I'm I'm actually priority." You know, because women don't understand what, what it's like. So she, she left, uh, and that that, that 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 has got dissolved. So there I am now. I'm twice divorced. I'm here. I am, and I've got a little bit of money, and I'm having to rebuild my life. Um, then I just started to rebuild my life. Then alhamdulillah, I met my now wife. Um, so wife number three now. Wife number three now, and I'm on the up. Mashallah. Um, but it's always left a bitter taste in my mouth. That how did I get beaten? So from that, I started to just help everybody, anybody, uh, through Facebook and stuff like that. There's, there's all these kind of forums and stuff. Um, and I started to do a bit of reading and start to realize that there's a system at play here. And I started, because obviously I work in, my day job, I work in IT. So I'm a very systematic kind of guy, you know, algorithms and all this sorts of stuff. So I started to spot the system and as I'm helping more and more men, any non-Muslim, Muslim, didn't matter. But then over time, I just started to notice more and more Muslim men come in. And there was no no help for them because the the white the the white audience the non Muslim audience yeah. don't understand the Muslim experience. Is it because we have different social sort of religious based issues? So what we what Muslim men face yeah. when we're going into these situations is the same as what the non Muslim men get: rape, physical abuse, financial abuse, this and the other. But we also get like tossed in the Islamic extremism, forcing me to wear hijab, niqab. Like everything that they did at their father's house, right, right. they bring it in and saying, "Oh, they, you know, he 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 fought enforced on me." The other audience don't understand that; um, they don't know how to deal with it. And plus, also a lot of the brothers they don't speak English because they're taxi drivers. They come from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, from South, from various different places, Somalia, and all, all sorts. So they they can't articulate themselves properly t- to that audience, and that audience they don't understand our culture and you know, you know faith. So and, and they perhaps not looked very sympathetically when they're standing. Yeah, there. Islamophobia is a real thing, brothers. Like irrespective yeah. of Islamophobia, would you say if a man stands accused, where the woman is the alleger, she's done the allegations, automatically the sympathy is with the woman. Absolutely. Even even from this, you'll see in the comments, um, you, you'll get the what about free. The sisters will come in. But what about the abusive men? Because I'm talking about the the abuse that men are facing through child access. But just just on that point, and we'll come back to that story. Majority of the domestic disputes, violence, and problems that I've actually gone through myself in terms of talking to people, it's been with the dynamics of the man being the abuser. So you know, let's not forget that as well. That a lot of the men are abusers in these situations well, as well. I'll say this: men. Are by nature, are very quiet. If you've got problems in your household, you don't you don't come out with it freely. I don't come out with it freely. Men don't come out with it freely. Women do, right? But men don't. Mm-hmm. Now, there's been a recent statistic that, do you know, 40% of domestic uh, abuse cases mm-hmm. are, are actually reported by men. But that's still a minority compared to the majority. So 40 to 60%, you know, it's st- and that's with men being quiet. Okay. Right? You know, men don't generally report stuff. Yeah, but I but I'm saying that, what I'm saying I'm not saying that men don't abuse women. I, yeah, they do, but then women do also abuse men. Oh, and of course, so, that that's so, that's an undeniable fact that this does happen. Yeah, but the majority of the abusers are men who abuse women. I say this. All right, let's even go with that. Let's let's say that's true. 
But it doesn't dispel the truth that men also get abused. No, I'm not saying. I, I, I acknowledge no, no, that. No, no, but, but I'm saying. But see, I'm just the way I'm trying to counter that is abuse is abuse, yes. and all types of abuse it is wrong. Be condoned, it's wrong. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. So now, whether it's a smack where everybody says no, 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 but withholding child access and using children as leverage and collateral is wrong. See, that's what we want to talk about today, specifically, where in these situations we are found, we are finding. More and more women are using children as leverage to control and exact revenge on their ex-partners and husbands. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation you found yourself to be in, obviously. Yeah, so I mean, so the motivations from the hundreds of brothers that we've helped, yeah. the motivations are kind of kind of grouped into kind of three. Financial, control, and revenge. Yeah. Mine was financial and maybe a bit of revenge. I don't know. But we'll go with financial. So my situation was that. So kind of going back to my story there. Um, so I started to look. So from there, I realized that well, Muslim men need a lane for this. We need a place that we can share our stories, our knowledge, our experiences, and help each other, lift each other up. So we created the Muslim Fathers Support Forum on Facebook. And we started off with about four people. And over time, at the last count, you know, um, we're, we're about 500 plus strong on Facebook. We've got a, a WhatsApp group that's um, that's got 200 plus brothers, and that group, these groups are active. You know, there's a, a content on on there, but we're more content, uh, more more active on uh, from a support perspective on the WhatsApp group where brothers are sharing their stories and we're helping each other. It's peer support because when you when you do, when you're going through this situation, you, you, if you tell a man. That's never been through it. Like, oh, bro, you know, I feel broken. This, that, the other. He'll sympathize with you. Like, yeah. But he, he won't understand. He won't understand it. He, and he won't feel that. When you say certain things, it won't resonate with him. Like, he'll know that feeling. Yeah. But when you're in that group and brothers are saying this, everybody's like, yeah. I feel suicidal. Yeah. I feel broken. Yeah. Did you ever feel suicidal? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, children, for a man, you know, heart and soul, and that's been taken away from you, ripped, ripped away from you. Um, and then you're thinking, like, well, how do I carry on? Like, what's, you know, what's the, point? what's the point? And so many brothers are there. Like, one brother telling me, you know, brother Khalid, you know, that he, he, he was in his workshop. It was a like mechanic or something. And he had the beam across there like that. And he was going to throw the chain over and thought, let me just, you know, end it here when he lost his kids and stuff. Really? Yeah, and and it's prevalent. You hear it. And sorry, he didn't do that. Did no, he? he didn't do that because Dean. This is the Peter Dean. You know what? The, 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 this is the the difference between the Muslim and the non-Muslims. You know, or, or the people of faith, because, whichever because faith our, it is. Our faith prohibits suicide. Yeah, but, um, but there's a strength. Our, our, yeah, it has that. But there's a strength in believing in, in Allah, in whichever flavor it is. Because if you see people with faith, you know, even if they're Christian, Yahud, um, Hindu, Sikhs, whatever it is, when you have that faith in God. It, it brings you comfort. There's a comfort in it to the non-believers. And this is why you see the stats of suicide in men. You know, 12 men a day are dying from suicide. Mm. Even now, just before turning him, you know, there's that, there's a certain character, uh, I don't know if they know, but I think he was quite well off. He, you know, he, uh, he was on that De Alan, Ellen De 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 DeGeneres show. He was something on that. He's some kind of guy who used to dance about or something. Okay. The DJs. He's just taken his life and he shot himself. Okay. This guy had millions, he had celebrity, he was good looking, he had a wife, had a family, he had two kids, and he See, shot that, himself. That, that is a separate conversation altogether. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've actually done a, a podcast on this, why people commit suicide, and a lot of the times, because we ourselves are very spiritual people, we say that if, you, if you're devoid of the spirituality and the connection with God, and having this sense of knowing about the hereafter and life mm -hmm. after death, then... Whatever happens to you in this world, if you think this is the be-all, end-all, any problem is going to seem like insurmountable. Absolutely. But I'll tell you this much, you know, and my relationship with Allah suffered through this. It would have, I can understand, because you're so preoccupied with problems, daily battles, that it leaves little time for worship, perhaps. Well, it's not even just that, because this, I'll tell you this much, the ever, hardest ever test a man will have is to lose his children. You know, it's uh, almost a question of why me, why me? Yeah, why me? Absolutely. It's like having, uh, every day was like a, me performing a janazah for children that are alive. 
Yeah. My children were literally a mile away from me. But we unable I to see them. See them. Even now, they're like three, four, five miles away from me. So you still haven't been able to I still haven't to because the poison's so deep and I don't have it. Like, I don't know. I, don't, I just I don't. Maybe I don't have the skill set to try and work this out. It's a tough one. And my the, I, the hatred I have for her, it takes over. But that, but Ahmed uh, Ridan, that's not healthy for you. No, it's not. Well, but the thing is, but what must be taken from me is th- forget the money, forget the house, forget everything else. You've taken my daughter from me. Me and my daughter had, were like that. And this is the thing what sisters don't realize. When you do this, when you take take a man's child away from him, his children, you're taking something that's just irreplaceable. Irreplaceable. Right? And I'm like, I've moved on. I've got two beautiful children. I'm like, my house is, the house I have is such full of joy. But that pain still doesn't go. Allah's replaced everything. Everything's been replaced. But that, that pain is still there. Look, I can't, maybe, I can never imagine that, tr- the trauma of losing your children because, alhamdulillah, I've not been through that. But at the same time, if you've said you moved on, but you really haven't, because if you've got so, harboring so much resentment and hatred for your ex-wife, she's probably living happily and she's unaware of this resentment and hatred or it's not bothering her. If anything, it's you are the one who is being mentally tortured. You are the one who is keeping you awake at night, you know, thinking about her and you know, hating her and probably sending oh, so no. much negative, spending so much negative energy on this. Uh, well, the, th- the thing is, I say this, you know, it's easier said than done, right? I'm being very honest here. I could, I could give you the, 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 the easy thing, yeah. but this is what men feel. Yeah. This is how we feel. You know, when, you know, look, the house, you know, yeah, whatever, right? The car, the Bugatti, click the Bugatti. Yeah. yeah, whatever. You know, that's replaceable. But that time with my children, now, even if you were to reconcile now. You've you got know, some valuable years in it. I, I, I met my son uh, a while back. He was at the hospital. And I met him By there. chance? Um, no. So she texted me saying, oh, because I work, my, my workplace is near the, uh, the hospital in Leicester. So she texted me. So this must have been about five, five years after. Like that. So now I've met. Now my son, from being a 14-year-old, he's like this six foot four man. Yeah. I go there and I just slam to him. And, he's like, uh. and we're, we're talking, but I realized this is not my the son that I know. Yeah, well, because of the distance between you two now. He's totally different. Yeah, he had rings on him. He had like, uh, you know, like he had some kind of weird dress outfit on, and whatever. you know, obviously he's into what the, what the kids are into these days and stuff. But I've not been on that journey with him. Yeah, I left him at fourteen, and I, I only can remember him at fourteen. My daughter was at eight years old. I can remember her at eight. That, that, you know, but now they've grown into these young adults. adults yeah. And I just knew that I can't get into that. So you couldn't bond with him? I can't, you know. And I don't have, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, you know. Inshallah, we're still searching, still searching, still trying to work it out. I'm not saying I'm not. But so you went to hospital because he was in? Yeah, because uh, he hurt his foot or something and he was there. So I worked, I thought, right. So wasn't that the chance for you to try and reestablish contact with him? Yeah. I, He's an adult now. The wife, ex-wife can no longer hopefully or you know brainwash him or poison his mind against you yeah. now as an adult he can reach out to you independently i think in all honesty w- w- once you go through this when, as a child that's alienated you know uh, you know we've got a, a brother he was saying that he was alienated from his father yeah. and, it, and it took him when, until he became a man like a proper man himself yeah um you know and he his, his life experience made him realize actually you know what my dad well, he must have went through and this and the other. And I think that's what I'm waiting for, perhaps. When they get that life experience, that, that'll that open the door and they'll realize. Oh, and they'll find, come and find you. Yeah, that maybe the mum the telling them that dad wants to kick us out of the house and move his new family in and all this isn't true. And it was never true. You know, um, all these things, you know, we keep making dua. So, like your daughter, you've not met her? No. Um, and to be honest, I, I've not seen her. So, you, you know. Not even a photo? No. You've not tried looking for them on social media? I've tried looking for her on social media. Um, you know, the thing is, she, she contacted me over, uh, her, she got a phone, uh, a phone and stuff. But the problem with that is, the mother's there in the background. 
dictating, pushing, writing. Sometimes she writes as them, and I know it's her. Yeah, you know, um, you know, and that that way, I just found that you know what it causes me distress. Then it affects my family. So sometimes that's why you have to create that distance for me to be the best version of me for my family, for my current family, or for my, you know, um, and to be the best I can be for them. Um, and then when the time's right, when Allah wills it, this will get fixed. And then the truth will be the truth. Uh, and then everybody will realize what's what. And, and the day of accountability is there for all of us. Of course. And I'll leave it for that, you know. And yeah, and I, but I have every right to have hatred for her because what she's stolen, what she's taken, isn't hers. Um, and she's taken something that's priceless, irreplaceable. So you don't think you'll ever be able to forgive no. her? No. And, and I'm sure many for, many brothers will try and this, that, the other, right? And I think it's easier for brothers that do reconcile with their kids but right now, the, you know, without reconciliation and stuff like this, is the space I'm in, and and it'll stay that way. So, has your current wife's reaction been to all this? No doubt, she's obviously uh, has seen. Maybe she didn't see you go through this, but obviously, you are the man that you are now because of all those bitter experiences. Yeah, and I'm like, you know, and I think she gets the better version of me. I'm not. The children get the better version of me. She's my rock. Uh, you know, she knows. She knows the amount of effort I put in to Muslim fathers. Um, she knows the amount of effort I put in to help brothers get, to get to get back with their kids. Um, and you know, she's a part of this journey as much as anybody. Like for Muslim fathers, because she allows me. She she looks after the kids for me to free me up to do this. We're, we're a team, and she, she's my rock. You know, um, I, I can't. The amount of dua I give her every single day. You know, she looks after my mom. She takes my she brings my mom to Birmingham. They go shopping here. You know, my mom's um, my wife's a Pakistani, so there's a cultural difference, and she's adapted. And everybody out of my family love her, you know, and they realise the quality she she has and the person she is and the, what, what she brings. Um, you know, all my family. It's been a blessing, and it, that's one thing that actually brought me back to Allah is her, because for a long time, for a fair few years, I was like, I stopped praying. Stop praying. How many years? For what would have been like, do you to about three, four, five years? Yeah, but look, again, your journey has been horrific. I can't take that away from you. And I maybe, as I've, as you've said, many people cannot, we can sympathize with you, mm. but we may not fully understand. But for my part, I've seen a lot of people who, again, mm -hmm. come to me for advice and counseling that people do go through horrendous mm. situations. But for people of faith, as yourself, you know, born into a Muslim family, you were a practicing brother. When you had these problems, the first thing we should be doing is turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not abandoning our journey and disconnecting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. The way I, well, the thing is, it's... In hindsight. Yeah, hindsight or being reflective. Allah sent me on a journey that I needed. I didn't want it. But I needed it. Why do you think you needed it? Because I'm quite trusting. Um, I take people at face value. You're good to me. I'm good to you. And, you know, and my family at the time told me that I would put this into writing, do it, into, do it properly. And I'm like, no, mum, Sonny Mama, he's passed away now. You know, like, we don't need this. She's a decent woman. You know, she fears Allah. You know, we don't need this. So Allah told me a lesson that, listen, that's not the barometer of a person, you know. Just because they got the doesn't make they they make them the right person. And then also have had to reflect as a human being what I'm about, you know. Um, lots of things. It's it's so much. Even as a father, I look upon my time the way I was as a father because I was in such an unhappy relationship that sometimes it, you know, especially my son, you know, I, I took it out on him. My daughter. I treated her like my princess. Me and her were so close. Um, but my son, you know, he got, he got the brunt of it at times. Like, oh, just get on. That, 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 that version of me, you know. Um, and I, d I didn't know how to make myself happy, in all honesty. There was, there was lots, lots of things I had to learn. And this journey taught me those things. Yeah, but at the same time, 
if your ex-wife was sitting here and I was to ask her the same question, she'd probably say, this man, he was difficult to live with. He had anger issues, he was moody, or he was this, he used to shout at the kids. So no doubt, as I mentioned earlier, she'd have her own version yeah. of story to tell as well. But, and you but, also said, you're now the best version to your current wife. So are you saying that in the first wife, you weren't the best version, obviously? But, but I'll tell you this much. My home, my current home, allows me to flourish. Me and my wife, we hardly ever argue. She understands me, and she gives me the space to be me, and she gives me the space to flourish. Looking back on the, uh, the first marriage, mm -hmm. I never had that. So I'm not saying it's her fault. She was young as well, I'm not, you know, and she was still learning herself, I'm guessing. But the environments, the women create the environments. Our homes are, are created by the women. You know, the comfort, the, the, the sakoon, the, the vibe, the, the, the feel, the scent, all that. The women create. The man looks forward to going home. Exactly. And then in that home, if a man can sit down and be like, <sighs> and all that, all the day just dis disappears. Yeah? That's, if the woman creates that, then the man's going to flourish and be better and be good. Maybe, yeah, I was the wrong sort, but I'm equally, I still say that, that, that in that environment created the worst version of Ahmed. Is it? So in your current relationship, if I was to ask who wears the trousers in the house, what would your response be? Um, in a weird way, it's, it's, it's me, you know, primary. I am the leader, right? The philosophy, the ideology, how we're going to achieve these things, how the kids are growing, um, you know, what they're going to be taught, what their philosophy will be, what, are, what are our aspirations, you know, what their aspirations should be along the lines of this, like of deen, or being Muslim, or doing good in the world. That, that, that comes from me. But everything else is my wife. You know, she creates our home. She, when I walk into the house, the house is warm, loving, caring. It's full of joy. She's the catalyst for that. MashaAllah. Sure. Ahmed Adan, we will continue this conversation in part two. This just concludes part one of our program. Inshallah, we'll be back with the second installment because... There's still a lot more to discuss with Ahmad Ridan regarding this issue of children being used as leverage to punish the fathers and deny access to the fathers. So we'll be back again, inshallah.